art historian Anne Higanay joins us to discuss Style Revolution, a project dedicated to the world's most original and influential style magazine, the Journal of Ladies and Fashion, this week on The Feminist Perspective. The Feminist Perspective with Dr. Sophia Johnson is made possible by Hollingsworth Real Estate Group. Ask Hollingsworth about real estate. And by Allstate. You're in good hands. Until the 20th century and long before Fashion Week and Instagram, art historian Anne Higanay says Journal of Ladies in Fashion, a groundbreaking Parisian style magazine, dominated the fashion scene on both sides of the Atlantic, offering men and women, Europeans and Americans, a startlingly new way to dress. The magazine was cutting edge, rejecting the rules, shapes, and materials that had once signaled luxury and social rank in favor of sexual self-expression and simplicity. Professor Higanay made the discovery in 2017 and says from its inception, the high-end fashion magazine was political. This dramatic experiment in individualism freed men to dress as they have ever since and for a brief time liberated women. The magazine is part of a recently digitized collection at the Morgan Library and Museum in New York and is the subject of her new book, forthcoming book that is, Style Revolution. Anne Higanay, welcome to The Feminist Perspective. It's lovely to be here. I have to tell you, this is really a topic that fascinates me. You write that the radical fashion we see in this collection tell the story of a sudden and short-lived upheaval in clothing history. But I think it does more than that. It stands as perhaps one of the most significant and creative attempts to reject the political crisis of the day. It was a call for modernity, but also civility, was it not? It was a way of expressing a whole new way of being. The idea was that one was no longer born into a particular social rank that determined what you wore, but rather that one could become anyone one wanted to be through style choices. Right. So tell us a little bit about what the fashion was leading up to this time. How, how can you sort of paint the picture, the context? Well, right up until the French Revolution, there was a very, very rigid triangle in society. At the top, there was no one but the king and queen mm -hmm. who got to wear very thickly embroidered silks and velvets with gold and silver thread and ermine fur and lots and lots of jewels. Right. And then from there on down, there was a cascading series of rules called sumptuary rules. And when you got to the bottom and you were really poor, you just wore rags. Yeah, interesting. So, and, and, and the revolution in many ways contributed to sort of, it, it revolutionized the way people sort of could own and what, what did the revolution mean for the fashion space? The revolution said that although, of course, some people would turn out to be more stylish than others, mm -hmm. but that basically, instead of having the king and queen at the top of a pyramid and 99% of the country down at the base, that everyone would dress more or less the same. And the peak of fashion would be accessible to everybody. Nice. Another interesting observation, sort of piggybacking off that point you've just made, another interesting um, observation in this collection is that it explicitly reveals um, significant innovation in everyday fashion after the French Revolution, but also giving language, giving to the language of fashion a new political dimension. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. How is attire inspired by ideological considerations and social hierarchies during this time? Well, before the French Revolution, by dressing the way you were supposed to, you showed that you were obeying the system of monarchy. Mm -hmm. And what happened afterward was that people showed that they believed in democracy so utterly that they would wear it like a second skin. Hmm. Human beings have a capacity to design for themselves hmm. a, a social appearance. And in one fell swoop, in 1795, 96, 97, really three short years, people began to show the world that they believed in individualism and democracy through the clothes they wore. But how did this come about? How did the idea of, you know what, I'm not, I'm not gonna do this anymore. Like, where did this idea come from? Were there philosophers at the time, certainly, um, 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 advancing new ideas? H how would you say 
this idea of democracy came about to influence the space? Well, when you have a really big clothing change, there have to be a number of converging factors, right. I would say. And in this case, there was the Enlightenment philosophy that drove the politics of the French Revolution. There were some very, very bold style leaders, including Josephine de Beauharnais, who would go on to marry the man who became the Emperor Napoleon. There was a global trade in textiles, mm -hmm. which suddenly flooded France with Indian cottons. Right. And lastly, and we can feel this because we know about creative disruption in so many fields, mm -hmm. the French Revolution just toppled the entire system of work and craft right. with two laws passed in 1791. And on this completely new playing field of fashion, mm -hmm. designers and consumers together staged the biggest revolution in clothing history ever. Wow, I just, I, I told you in our initial conversation how amazed I was by the work that you were doing. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, your project, Style Revolution. I love this. I, I, I thought this was an amazing find in our time and that no one had really sort of uncovered it. Um, the French Revolution enabled Parisian women and men to reinvent themselves, um, and style revolution is really giving us some sense of that. Um, although, in many ways, I have found and I've read that women still rarely appeared alone in this magazine. Um, and this abandonment, in many ways, of restrictive style was also a violation of gender norms. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, well, one way in which fashion was revolutionary was that it was led by a magazine, which purported to show everyone how they could be super stylish, mm -hmm. as opposed to having a court etiquette that ruled the top of fashion. Mm -hmm. And then from there on in, there was just, or there on down, it was just a trickle down of less and less valuable materials right. and less and less beautiful craftsmanship. What the magazine said instead was, here are, for women, simple shapes made out of cotton. For men, there's the tailoring of wool suits. Mm -hmm. And within that level playing field, everyone gets to make the style choices that express who they are as individuals. Mm -hmm. And the most dramatic example for women was that they were so determined to DIY, do it yourself, right. that they gave up complicated, constructed outer wraps and right. instead adopted shawls, which they could twirl and swirl and drape around themselves in a completely personal way. And, and then un underneath the shawls, they wore very, very simple dresses. Mm. They, completely abandoned mm -hmm. all of the restrictive underwear, the restrictive corsets, the restrictive petticoats, and instead they wore really comfortable, long, tubular, draped dresses. Now, how did society respond to that? I can't imagine everyone, like, the, you know, would have been okay with that. Oh. It seems like a major faux pas to, it, you know, to wear something that looked most like, more like underwear, really. It was. It was women turning their underwear into outerwear. People were divided. On the one hand, they wanted a whole new revolutionary world. Right. They wanted to reinvent time. They wanted to reinvent measurement. They right. wanted to reinvent fashion. But on the other hand, they didn't realize how far women would go mm -hmm. and how women would take the revolution so seriously that they would dress more comfortably mm -hmm and more like men mm. than women had ever dressed before. And while it was alluring mm -hmm. and attractive, it was also, for many men, very, very scary and threatening. Mm -hmm. Now, how did the political leadership of the day respond to this? At first, with delight. For one thing, 
women seemed gorgeously unbound really? and and there on the streets in all their beauty. Yeah. But then as they began to think about what the implications were <laughs> of women having liberated themselves right. from restrictive clothing, yes. they began to think, oh, well, maybe we went too far. Yeah. So then, uh, led by Napoleon himself, sure. the fashion pendulum began to swing back. 1802, not so good. 1804, very big changes. By 1810, 1815, the underwear was coming back. By 1820, 25, the women were just as, as bound by their clothes as they had ever been. I mean, isn't this interesting? Because in many ways, I see these pop-up fashion houses, H&M, Forever 21, almost responding in a similar way to the needs of the masses. Like, how many people could really go and shop on Fifth Avenue and the Louis Vuitton and the Donna Karen and, you know, the Dolce & Gabbana? So you have a lot of um, um, retailers responding with the polyester and sort of do you find that there's some parallels in between what happened during that time and sort of how um, the industry is responding to the the, the larger needs of, of so you know of, of people today? Oh, I think you've got it exactly right, which is that it took us a very long time to catch up to the revolutionary fashions of 1797-1804, and it's now that the same kind of revolution is happening again. part of the fashion and Labor Day is not the old dictates you put away the straw hat and the summer linen clothes. That's not the case. What does change though, and has I remember in the 50s it was the same way. A lot of it is about those who control the peak of fashion, yeah. the great fashion houses and the fashion industry taking their cue from the street, taking yeah. their cue from radically changing body politics, right. and offering new sorts of possibility for what is the most stylish. It's not that street wear didn't exist before, before now. Yeah. It's not that there wasn't gender bending yeah. before now. Yeah. But it wasn't the top of fashion the mm -hmm. way it is becoming now. So. We're having another revolution. In a way. The way we had way, way back at the end of the 18th century. And you're so right. It calls into question economics. Right. And it calls into question gender rules. I love it. And you've jumped the gun. That was the next question. So let's fast forward, obviously, to 2019. Um, what has been the creative response to the political crisis of the day? If there is one, um, obviously intimating that we're in the middle of a crisis, but what has been the creative response? What would you say fashion magazines tell us about the times we're living in? Well, we're undergoing the, the biggest realignment of fashion and gender since so. 1797, 1804. Right. Because what happened in the, in the French Revolution was women saying, we could be more equal to men, and we're going to show it with our clothes. And yeah. that was such a stunning thing to say that it took hundreds of years for that to really happen. Right. And now what we're saying is, actually, we want to call into question gender itself. Mm. We want to erase some of the ways in which clothing has served to very sharply differentiate masculinity and femininity yeah. and propose gorgeous body affirming options mm. that break gender rules. And that in itself is what is so political. I want to explore a little bit further the political dimension of fashion. I think that this is really poignant in our time. Um, there's a great deal of tension, this national identity politic. There's a lot of divisiveness sort of on the in, in the in the political landscape. And I'm wondering if you could sort of shed some light, help us to look backwards to understand what it is we're going through, um, and how does the creative world sort of help us to to make sense of what, of, of what's of what's happening? Well, even in a time that was supposedly very individualistic. Mm -hmm. 
we now realize that people were very divided by gender. Mm. Men were supposed to look one way, women were supposed to look a very, very different way. There were clothing differences according to socioeconomic status, there were clothing differences according to race. Right. And now what's happening is that we're taking the idea of individualism to a much greater degree so that a person can pick and choose clothing styles from what's masculine, from what's feminine, mm -hmm. from what's Indian, from what's Native American, mm -hmm. from what's white, from mm -hmm. what's preppy, from what's uh, hip hop, from right. what's streetwear. You can you can put the penny loafers together with the T-shirt. Right. You you can you can have a very masculine jacket with an extremely feminine shirt. Right. And and by doing that, fashion is asserting that individualism has reached a whole new place, hmm. and clothing can express that. Wow. But I mean, I wonder. You know, I wonder about. Um, I wonder if there's more to it. It feels almost chaotic, right? Well, revolution feels extremely chaotic. I, I know from the, the period I've been studying that the language of panic mm -hmm. was always about chaos. Mm. It was about, oh, the old rules don't apply. Mm. We go into the street and we don't know who people really are. Their clothing isn't giving us the reliable messages that we used to believe were always the truth. Yeah. And in a way, that's exactly what's happening now. You go into the street, you look at someone, you say, was that a man? Was that a woman? Are they poor? <laughs> are they poor? Are they not poor? Yeah. Are they poor or are they just super cool? A am I rich? <laughs> am I poor? Yeah. Am I like a total dud? Yeah. Who yeah, am I? Yeah, yeah. And and we, we, we look at other people for a set of much, much more flexible cues yeah. that we, we want to pick and choose from. It, it's all about being able to identify with the style choices that people all around us make. Right. And, and it's, like a, it's like a kaleidoscope. Right. It does feel very chaotic, right. but it's so free form that it gives us a chance to, to make outfits of, of a sort that no one would ever have been able to imagine even 20 years ago. Right, I mean, what's curious to me, I've spent time in Brazil, India, Prague, Paris, and, every, and it seems that the young people, the millennials, they're, they're all embracing the same sort of fashion style. And so that's curious to me, because these are people from very different social spaces, you know, you've got some suburban kids exploring fashion, and I, I don't—I can't even make head or tails of it. I mean, I'm asking the very questions you're asking: Is this cool or not cool? Are they rich or are they poor? Are they, you know, do they speak French or not? I've—I I have no idea what to make of it. But what I do recognize is that globally, there seems to be a wave. I had assumed in my own sort of very basic analysis that young people are feeling confused and they need guidance and maybe they're exploring. I don't know if that's part of what um, this space tells us. I'm just sort of trying to figure out what's, what's, what's going on. Well, it does feel confusing, but out of the welter of style choices mm. that seem to be almost unlimited in terms of geography, in terms of gender, in sure. terms of, of different cultural influences, you, you see young people on the street who are managing to look more unique than, than ever before. Right. And contrary to what we'd think, there, there's a new kind of lush formality that is emerging out of being able to pick and choose among athleisure options, yeah. for example. You know, when, when, people, when people want to dress up, they still really can. Yeah. So what do you see? I mean, this is really interesting, this point you raise up, that you can sort of see some sort of pattern. Can you ex explain or explore that a thought a little bit? Well, what we're, we're seeing is a, a diffusion of feminine clothing traits 
toward the masculine side, mm. and a number of masculine clothing traits being now adoptable by women. Mm. But also there's a high-low yeah. interplay with aspects of street wear or athleisure wear suddenly being reinvented as evening wear mm. or black tie even, sure. not that it's black or right. involves ties right, anymore. Right. Um, and, and, and also we're, we're seeing aspects of, of formality in street wear. Like what could be more styled and more geometrically artificial than some of the amazing sneakers that we see on the subway now? Yeah, for sure. For sure, and we talked a little bit about that on our during our telephone conversation. Um, if you sort of look at the, the draft night for the NFL or the NBA and the styles that are sort of emerging, how people are expressing themselves, um, this idea of masculinity is being, I don't, I don't want to say diffused, but it's, it, it's like a, I don't want to say watering down, but it, 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 you find these very machismo athletes um, wearing uh, attire that we sort of wouldn't traditionally f feel or think are, are, are masculine. Well, and for someone who's been really looking at the revolution of 1797-1804, yeah. what's wonderful to see is that some aspects of the revolutionary style are being maintained, mm. but we're now dipping back into some of the visual traits from before the revolution. So before the revolution, m men wore the same range of colors, right. had the same degree of lavish embroidery and lace as women, although the shapes huh. of the clothes were slightly different. Right. And what we're seeing now is a masculinity that is not afraid to go back to color, mm. texture, embroidery, pattern, yeah. shine, yeah. and gleam. Sure. And, and we're seeing women mm -hmm. who are not afraid of, uh, of tailoring. They feel that, and you see it in, in the work of a lot of designers now, they feel that tailoring can bring out the femininity of a body. Right. Whereas for many hundreds of years, the idea was that, well, tailoring was about bringing out the masculinity of, of bodies. Right. So we're mixing it up among the men and we're mixing it up among the women. I love it, I really do. This is fascinating. When we talked a few weeks ago, you suggested fashion is in many ways a balancing of the old and the new, recurring revivals of style and innovation of self. You've sort of reiterated that point here during our conversation. What has been the legacy of this collection that you've just unearthed at the at the museum, um, the legacy of this collection, but also other narratives about 19th century art, including, as we discussed, Denise Murrell's extraordinary exhibition entitled Posing Modernity, which explores mm -hmm. the changing modes of representation of the black figure essential to development of modern art. What's the legacy um, of 19th century art? Well, my student, Denise, brilliantly realized that as the most forward-looking minds defined modernity, gender was at stake mm -hmm. and race was always at stake. Mm -hmm. The way in which that expressed itself in clothing yeah. is that uh, newly freed Franco-Africans or African-Americans found a dignity in the adoption of clothing that had not existed before the French Revolution. They too partook of this new modern revolution in clothing. Mm -hmm. And they expressed th their dignity as, as individuals mm. and also their freedom as workers in a wage market mm -hmm. as opposed to a, a slave economy. Sure. And as time went on, the scope for individuality in the clothing of Franco-Africans mm. and African-Americans did nothing but increase and became more and more of an influence on high fashion. Mm. 
so that by the moment we're living now, everyone contributes equally to the mix that is contemporary fashion. Although in so many ways, our society is still very unequal, in the domain of fashion, I think we've, we've reached an unprecedented degree of equality. I love it, honestly. We didn't even talk about your book. Um, I want to ask you one final question. Is there a magazine out there today that captures the essence of fashion and style? Just as in the French Revolution, the huge change was between one kind of leading voice and another kind of leading voice from court etiquette to the fashion magazine, what we're seeing now is the passage of power from the fashion magazine to Instagram. I love it. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with me. Thank you for coming to The Feminist Perspective. I hope to continue this conversation. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Of course. The Feminist Perspective with Dr. Sophia Johnson is made possible by Hollingsworth Real Estate Group. Ask Hollingsworth about real estate. And by Allstate. You're in good hands.